And thanks everyone for coming along tonight. I think it's going to be a really lively discussion. Um, this is obviously an issue that affects all of us, whether we're worried about how much meat we consume, the impact that that has on the environment, or um, these emerging technologies that we hear about and read about in the media. Um, and even if we don't eat meat ourselves, the kind of impacts that they might have on other um, food sources and the environment. So um, I'm sure you all have a lot of questions um, to ask our panellists, and we've got a brilliant panel tonight. So the format that, if anyone hasn't been here before, the format is we've got about half an hour when we're going to hear from each of our speakers in turn who are going to talk a bit about their own work and their um, perspective that they're coming at um, on this topic. And then at about 7 o'clock we'll have a break for everyone to refill their glasses and think about the questions that you'd like to ask and then we'll reconvene and we'll have about 50 minutes for Q&A. So please do hold on to those questions and um, we'll come back to them later. Um, but let me just introduce um, our panel. Um, first to speak tonight will be Professor Helen Sang. She is at the Roslyn Institute in Edinburgh where she's the personal chair in vertebrate molecular development. Her research is primarily, primarily concerned with developing GM <coughs> chickens, um, which are bred to be resistant to bird flu. Um, and she's also worked on the production of transgenic chickens, which um, produce molecules, um, drugs that we can use for medical use in their eggs. Then we have Vicky Hurd, who is the senior campaigner for land use, food and water security at Friends of the Earth and is also a consultant on food and environmental policy. She's worked on um, a number of reports and publications and is the author of a book, Perfectly Safe to Eat, The Facts on Food. Um, and Vicky's also um, been involved in, she's the chair of the Eating Better Alliance, which um, I'm sure we'll hear more about later. And finally, we'll be hearing from Richard Tiffin, who is the director of the Centre for Food Security at the University of Reading. Richard is also a professor of applied economics. He works on policies which aim to improve diet and health. So Richard's worked on things like fat tax and sugar tax to try and improve um, people's diets. Um, and so I think he's going to be talking a bit as well about whether we can do the same thing for meat. Could we give people an, an environment tax on their, on their meat? So, um, Helen, would you like to kick things off um, with some information about what you've been working on? Okay, so I'm Helen Sang. So I work, as uh, said, at uh, the Roslyn Institute at the University of Edinburgh, and uh, my research is funded in part, at least, by the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council. And the Roslyn Institute is an animal science institute, and within that, my research is on chickens, specifically genetic modification of chickens and, and many applications of these technologies, uh, but including GM chickens for food. Uh, and usually if I tell people I work on chickens, I get laughter, chicken jokes, but actually chickens are extremely important uh, in human nutrition and uh, over 50 billion chickens are hatched in the world per year, so that's getting on for 10 per person. So they're the most abundant, by far, food animal. And they're very important in terms of high quality nutrition from poultry, meat and eggs. Uh, and it's, they're cheap and relatively easy to be kept in small or large numbers. Uh, and the production of these 50 billion chickens in the world per year has been underpinned by a very uh, successful and effective poultry breeding genetics. And this is done by uh, poultry breeding companies uh, and they uh, are very effective at increasing the productivity of chickens and at uh, dis distribution of chickens. So uh, some data that come from the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization uh, on the increase in consumption of chicken products, that's meat and eggs. For example, Brazil, in the period between early 1960s and 2006, the consumption of poultry meat went up from about 1 million tons to 10 million tons. And in that period in China, the consumption of eggs went up from under a million tons to 80 million tons. Uh, and this is an enormous amount of animal product uh, from chickens. Uh, and as 
part of the production and genetics has been an increase in the efficiency of these animals. So uh, during that period, the number of eggs produced by chickens per tonne of food has gone from 5,000 to 9,000. Um, and the number of eggs per chicken per year has gone from about 230 to 300. So genetics is increasingly sophisticated and is using new genomic technologies and so on. Uh, but why would we want to use genetic modification in addition in, in the genetics and production of chickens? Well, diseases are a huge challenge in the production of chickens and other farm animals. Um, and uh, the disease that I'm particularly interested in working on is uh, bird flu. So bird flu is a flu virus and it's endemic in Southeast Asia. So it's a problem that will never go away. Uh, and uh, outbreaks of bird flu uh, have huge uh, economic losses. So in the current and ongoing uh, H5N1 bird flu outbreak that you will have heard of, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia, Hong Kong and other countries, uh, it's, cost, uh, about, it's cost many, many millions of pounds in lost productivity and it's estimated between 300 and 500 million chickens have been slaughtered because the only way of controlling the disease, is, if you get an outbreak, is to slaughter all the birds. So that's very wasteful and it's also uh, not welfare friendly at all because they're slaughtered as fast as possible using very crude methods. Um, so bird flu is, a, is an ongoing challenge uh, and it's not only uh, an issue in terms of poultry production, but it's very well established now that uh, bird flu uh, is the source of new pandemic flu viruses that affect humans. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the best known examples of that is the Spanish flu outbreak of 1914, where 40 million people died worldwide uh, from flu, which was a derived from a uh, flu virus that had been in uh, chicken populations. So how do you control a disease like flu? Uh, you can develop vaccines. Um, you can uh, consider using drugs or a genetic approach. You could look for genetic resistance. Now vaccines, people are working to develop uh, flu vaccines, uh, but I think uh, there are issues with that. If you use vaccination in uh, farm animals, it has to be a very, very cheap vaccine or it won't be taken up. Uh, and it has to be applied effectively, and that's a real issue to get that out to all the producers. Uh, it's not a problem, I think, in a country like the UK, where we have uh, a, regulated, a regulation of how animals are, are, are kept and produced. Um, so vaccination has its problems. In terms of genetics, I've said that the poultry breeders are very effective, but there's no evidence that there is genetic resistance to flu. So there isn't the sort of basic genetic material for the poultry breeders to work on. So a few years ago, I was approached by a colleague, Lawrence Tiley, who's at Cambridge University, who had some ideas about how you could express a completely new gene to uh, stop, block the infection of flu in chickens. So he is, and uh, his colleagues are developing new genes that uh, you can express and test in cells and show that you can stop flu infection. And what we're trying to do is to put those new genes into chickens so that they have a completely new uh, genetic characteristic that makes them resistant to flu infection. So that's uh, one of the programs that we're doing at the Roslyn Institute in collaboration with others. And I think the important thing about that is this using genetic modification, you're adding a characteristic to chickens that they do not have and they would not have in any other way. And if it's in their genetics, then you know that every animal will have that characteristic. So it's a very good way of introducing a valuable trait, a valuable characteristic, an important characteristic. Uh, and uh, more recently, in the last few years, there are new technologies coming along, and these are called uh, molecular scissors. So these are new ways of genetically modifying uh, cells or animals or plants or microorganisms. And these uh, molecular scissors, to explain them very quickly and without pictures, they allow us to make very small genetic changes very efficiently. Uh, and 
uh, another colleague uh, at the Rosalind Institute, uh, Bruce Whitelaw, is very interested in a disease of pigs called African swine fever, and that disease was endemic in Africa, but it's got into uh, commercial pigs in Russia, and it's clearly moving east, uh, and uh, it has a very high mortality rate. But it's known uh, that uh, wild pigs in Africa, warthogs, for example, don't get African, don't fall sick if they get infected with African swine fever virus. And uh, Bruce Whitelaw thinks he's identified a very small genetic difference between warthogs and our Eurasian commercial pigs uh, that may well underlie the fact that the warthogs don't get ill from the African swine fever virus, but our uh, European pigs do. And uh, what he, he is attempting to do is to move that genetic difference, that's, put the genetic difference that's in the warthog into the uh, European pig background using these molecular scissors. So they allow us to take a characteristic that we can uh, identify genetically in maybe a different breed or even a different species and move it straight into our pigs, which we have spent many tens of years uh, improving genetically. So we don't want to lose the genetic improvement we have in our current animals for production, uh, but we want to be able to introduce uh, additional valuable genetic traits. And one of the interesting things that's being discussed at the moment is that when we use these molecular scissors to make small genetic changes that have a big effect, uh, do we call that genetic modification or not? Because we're not introducing a new gene, uh, you might be able to find that mutation if you looked hard enough in one of your European pigs in a different, you know, maybe a rare breed or something, possibly has that, we don't know. Uh, so that's one of the things that uh, you will see being debated at the moment is, uh, can we use these new technologies in, uh, in farm animal breeding to, and, and do we regulate them in the same way as we look at genetic modification? And finally, I think, if we're thinking about genetic modification and, and can it help us improve animals to make them more productive? Uh, and one of the ways to be more productive is to avoid loss due to disease because, for example, there's an estimate that productivity of pigs in America and North America is about 10% less because uh, flu in pigs circulates in the pig population, so it's always decreasing the productivity of the animals. Uh, is can we add completely new characteristics? So a project I'm discussing with a colleague at the moment is, can we look at adding new enzymes using genetic modification to chickens, new enzymes that would be expressed in their, in their gut that would break down cellulose, so it would help them uh, gain uh, much more nutrition from uh, poorer quality feeds, because one of the problems with farm animals, one of the expenses and one of the reasons that they are, uh, you know, eating a lot of meat is not sustainable, is that you feed a lot of grain to animals rather than just eating the grain. So if you could uh, genetically modify animals so they could make use and get more nutrition out of the feed that they get, uh, would that be a good thing to do in terms of making them more productive uh, and making them more sustainable? And in terms of... Um genetically modified food that's available at the moment. There, there's no genetically modified meat yeah, so available on the market. Yeah. What's, the, what's the nearest thing that we have? What? So there's, there's uh, it's one of the things people think there are genetically modified animal foods out there, and there are none that have been passed for human consumption anywhere in the world. The nearest we have is the Aquabounty salmon in the States, where they've uh, developed a salmon that grows much faster. In fact, what it is is it uh, grows throughout the winter months when normally salmon just sit around eating and not growing, they put a, an extra growth hormone gene in and they, they grow faster. And that uh, has passed all the steps of regulation in the, in the US, but it's not been signed off because no politician will. Am I right in thinking it's been 19 years? Oh, it's a, it's a very long time in development. And... Um, over to you, Vicky. I've, I saw you raise an eyebrow there at some of the things that Helen said. Um, I'm sure you have some thoughts on, on some of these technologies. Well, yes. Um, 
Yes, I'm from Friends of the Earth, um, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. We have a separate sister organization in Scotland. And we're also part of an international network, which is 70, in 70 countries. And so we draw a lot from our international colleagues um, in terms of the impact of um, food and farming systems globally. So we draw a lot on that, but we also, I would like to stress, Friends of the Earth is very much evidence-based, science-based organisation. We're not, uh, despite what some, how our work is sometimes interpreted by the media, we do work with the science base. Um, I'm probably going to say something that might annoy a lot of you in the audience, but actually I think, you know, if we're talking about food security, feeding people um, sustainably and healthily, it's mostly about politics. It's not really about productivity. We actually grow and breed and rear enough food to feed ourselves now and another four billion. So, you know, I, I, I do a lot of talks about food security and about sometimes about genetic modification. I think quite a lot of it ends up being a little bit of a distraction or a red herring. And we should be talking about the governance of our food system, wh where it's at, who's in, who's in control, who decides how our food is used, and to a certain extent, what's grown, although I think that's a lot to do with what farmers know what should be grown, but they're not necessarily able to respond to what the market is telling them because they're so distant from the market. It's so manipulated by huge corporations globally, and those corporations are very few in number, and they're very powerful. They're powerful politically, and they're powerful within supply chain in terms of prices and everything. So I have to say, I think a lot of what we need to do is political. Um, that's not to denigrate the science and some of the, the, the work that's going on to make systems more sustainable, more efficient, although I think there's some different definitions of efficiency that need to be looked at. But I think it's about governance and it's about how we use food. So that needs to be about how we manage demand and diet um, and how we use crops, for instance, for biofuels and biomass, land, land use for biomass. That is all part of the picture because we're not using the products of the land efficiently. Um, and certainly throwing a huge amount of it into animals' throats, be it chickens or, or beef or pigs, um, is not the most efficient use for a lot of the, the crops. But that's not to say that we're not, we're advocating everybody going vegan or vegetarian. That is absolutely not what Friends of the Earth is about, although that's a perfectly um, welcome uh, lifestyle choice. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the impacts, but I'm not going to talk about them so much because there's a fantastic article that um, Rachel did on the website, the blog, which you've got some really good facts and figures, and I, I, I imagine a lot of you know some of them, like, you know, 75% of uh, agricultural land is used for feeding animals. Um, it's a huge amount of the agricultural water use is for feeding, the largest proportion is for, for um, animal feed and for um, cleaning animals in intensive systems and things like that. And the, the nearly 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions, something which is a massive threat, as I'm sure you're all aware, to, to life as we know it right now, 15% of greenhouse gas emissions come from the livestock sector. So there is really something to be done there um, and something to be addressed. And a huge amount of antibiotics, the largest amount of antibiotics used in, in, um, in the world is for um, rearing livestock. And I was just reading a report today about antibiotics um, and it, it really is quite, <laughs> quite extraordinary how we haven't actually got to grips with this because a huge amount of um, antibiotics used in the veterinary sector, used in pigs and poultry, as routine preventative um, medicine, not actually responding to a disease threat or a known disease within a, a flock. And that is something that we really need to get to grips with, and other countries in Europe are. But anyway, that, that's stopping us being able to use antibiotics for our own use in medicine. That doesn't mean just curing diseases, but actually being able to do operations, full stop. Your knee operation won't be possible if we haven't got antibiotics to sort you out afterwards with any infections. So those are some of the impacts, just a very broad sweep, and we could do many, many more. Um, but it's, um, I was also asked to talk a bit about good practice, good stuff, nice stuff. And I have come across over the years some fantastic examples of good practice when it comes to livestock. And one of the best ones, and I, I was um, involved in a big delegation going to the UN, speaking at the UN, at the Rio Earth Summit last uh, in 2012. And there was this fantastic Georgian farmer, and he used to have a, um, a big beef farm, um, thousands of animals, which he'd inherited from his, farm, uh, his father, and his father had inherited his father, and he'd been in the Civil War, and wonderful, wonderful character. 
And um, when he inherited the farm, he carried on with the very intensive system of um, feedlot, you know, concentrated agricultural feeding operation, where all the feed was brought in, the animals were reared very intensively, and used a lot of um, chemicals, a lot of medicines, and he got more and more unhappy about what he was actually doing. And over several decades, he changed the system to one of mixed farming, where he had cattle, but he also had um, a lot of poultry and mixed poultry. He invested in some abattoirs, and he increased the number of people working on that farm from two stockmen to 75, because he increased the on-farm marketing, on-farm processing. And it's a fantastic example that people have taken to uh, a lot at the moment. They do a lot of re um, local retail. And it was, a f it was a mixed farming system, so he actually grows most of his feed or gets it from his neighbours to feed the animals on the farm. And he called the chickens his fertiliser. Um, because the f chickens were actually fertilising the land and, and sheep as well. So it was a rotational system with rotational um, crops to feed the animals. And I think that's you know, really, really part of the solution, is to have a mixed farming system. Um, but it also means more jobs, and I think the economics of it are really important. I probably don't have a, a chance to talk about other examples. There's, there's a wonderful um, UK organisation called the Pasture-Fed Livestock Association, which is starting to really, really do a very detailed analysis of how they can market really good pasture-fed livestock that is based on a system which is truly sustainable and biodiverse-rich, which is really, really important because we're losing our biodiversity and we're losing the ecosystem services from that ecosystem, that biodiverse-rich e ecosystem within the farm. And that's an extremely um, dangerous route to take um, to lose those systems like you know, your pollinators, your water catchment areas, your roots that stop flooding from the trees and from the, all sorts of things. I think the other final good thing to talk about is the fact that consumers are beginning to recognise this. I've been doing polling. I started doing polling, YouGov polling, of the public perceptions of meat and how they would be willing to change. I started in 2007, and I did another one last year, and the same question about whether the consumers would know about these things had doubled. The number of consumers had doubled who knew that there was an environmental impact of food production, of meat production. That was really exciting, but also, what was also exciting was a lot more people now are willing to eat a little bit less meat. And horse meat had a bit of, you know, problem there. Uh, they were responding partly to the horse meat, but I'm doing more polling, and I think there is a general interest in the public, not the politicians, but the public, in, in this issue and eating less and better meat, which is what we're advocating. So we need guidelines, we need a long-term strategy to put our um, farming system into a far more sustainable footing, where feeds we produce here are feeding animals, where we're using waste, food waste, to feed animals. We used to have a system where the livestock we ate was mostly fed on byproducts or waste or grass. Now they're fed on crops and that crop should be feeding us. And so we need a strategy which is thinking ahead like that. We need subsidies to be shifted. Procurement, we need to have um, less and better meat in schools and hospitals. An awareness campaign, we need to have climate change measures which really help farmers adapt, diversify production. So it's a very big, very fast sweep through some of the things that Friends of the Earth are advocating. And we've started an alliance which um, Rachel mentioned called Eating Better, which I think has about 45 members all the way from RSPB to the British Dietetics Association, Oxfam, a whole range who all recognise we've got to do something about meat. Um, and I think that's where we need to focus. And, and I know I haven't spo spoken much about GM because I actually think it's, to me, it's a bit of a distraction and it might at some point in the future have a role to play. And genomics is really exciting what they're able to do. Uh, you were describing some interesting areas which we would obviously want a very strong regulatory framework for but the current GM crops just aren't part of the solution, so I'm not interested. But I would like to say I did cook some insect flour, cricket flour cookies the other day for my organisation, and they went down very well. So we we're interested in other <laughs> solutions, and I think it, would be, it was touched on in Rachel's blog again about insects as a possible solution, both as feed for livestock and also eating them direct as flour or directly. And I think you could look at that, but uh, I think it's early days yet in terms of northern acceptance of insects. That's probably all I'll say. Thank you. Uh, Richard, we've heard, we've heard from Helen about the science and from Vicky about some of the broader issues in terms of farming and, and things that farmers can do to, to make their products more sustainable and um, that we really need to have policy, policy measures in place mm -hmm. to change the situation. But it would be interesting to hear from a consumer's perspective. I mean, people make decisions about what they eat. They're very personal decisions. They probably don't think about quite how far-reaching they might be. 
And they're also intertwined with other factors like how much it costs or how healthy it is. And we're being told all the time that we need to be more healthy and have X, Y, and Z nutrients in, in what we buy and what we eat. And then you have issues with time and people have families to feed. How, how does that play into to these issues and how, what, what can economics tell us about the best way to tackle this? Okay, I, I'll come to all of those points, I think, <laughs> probably towards the end of what I wanted to say, but I wanted to, I wanted to start, I'm director of the Centre for Food Security at the University of Reading, as you've heard, and I wanted to just start by putting what I say in the context of the challenge that we face uh, in terms of meeting the food insecurity potentially of the world. So I'm sure everybody's familiar with the, uh, the challenge when it's put in terms of feeding 9 billion people in the world by the year 2050, and that needing a doubling of food production in order to meet that, in, in order to meet that challenge. But perhaps what people are less aware of is where that population growth is going to actually take place. So in these parts of the, this part of the world, um, the developed world, populations are not going to grow particularly, but they will be in, slightly, in very different places. So the urban population between now and, and 2050 is expected to double in, in the developed world, and the rural population will decline to keep the, the population roughly static in those parts of the world. But if you look at the less developed parts of the world and the very least developed countries, the urban population in those parts of the world will increase fourfold between now and 2050. Really, really big changes in where people are going to be living. Rural populations will increase, but by nothing like as much, by about a factor of one and a half in those, in those parts of the world. And so the challenge isn't just about producing more food. There are more subtle challenges that confront us. First of all, the challenge of logistics. How are we going to get food? from the rural populations into those really big cities. That's a really big logistics challenge, and who's going to meet that challenge? But probably more importantly and more interesting to this conversation is that the type of diet that people will eat in urban areas is going to be fundamentally different from the types of diet that people eat in rural areas. People eat differently when they, when they live in, in an urban area. And the, the fact that that's taking place already is reflected in the global trends in obesity, in obesity rates. And if you look at the top 10 countries for obesity rate growth in the last, in the last um, uh, eight or nine years, if I list those to you, the top 10 countries for obesity growth are Korea, Mongolia, China, US, Cambodia, Vietnam, Venezuela and Dominica. And this suggests that the problem that we're going to be confronted by in 2050 is not necessarily a pro problem of malnutrition and starvation, but actually we're going to be confronted with a lot of the Western diseases in parts of the world that are currently undernourished and, and malnourished. And I don't think enough of our attention has been focused on that challenge as we think about feeding the world in 2050. We have to think about the type of diets that people will be eating in 2050. Of course, we've already heard that overall greenhouse gas emissions from, from food and agriculture are a very significant part of what's produced, pr produced globally. They have declined. We have reduced greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture by around 15% from 1990 to 2008 in this country. But there's evidence to suggest that that's now plateauing, that we aren't, we're not getting the same rate of, rate of decrease. And the sources of that green, those greenhouse gas emissions, nitrous oxide, which comes largely from artificial fertilisers applied, applied to the land, but also methane, which is around 36% of, of the, of the uh, um, greenhouse gas emissions from UK agriculture, from the, live, from the livestock sector. So this is why livestock starts to become a substantial part of this, of this debate, I think, in, in that they're potentially are gains both from a, um, from a um, human health perspective and also from a, um, from a, a greenhouse gas and sustainability, um, sustainability perspective. Sorry, my computer is causing me some problems this evening. And if it starts making a funny noise, I'd apologize, but it's on its last legs, <laughs> I think. Okay, so I was asked to make a few remarks about, about what's happened to consumption and production of, of, of meat in, in the UK over the last uh, 10 or so years. 
So we've seen beef consumption fall by about 7%. There have been a number of factors that have caused that. Foot and mouth disease was a, was a, was a factor. The, um, uh, 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 and increasing prices, I think, probably have also had a significant impact. Poultry consumption has increased by around 2%. And significantly, again, in the context of the remarks I made earlier about people's diets changing, meat-based ready meals have increased by about 8%. Over that, over that period from 2009 to 2012. In terms of production, we're producing less red meat in the UK. Again, foot and mouth disease, I think, was a significant factor in that. So the production levels now in 2012, in comparison with 2009, are about 82% of what they were in 2000 and 2009. We're seeing slight increases. So in, um, in, 2000, uh, sorry, in 2009, the level was um, 77%. Uh, it's now 82% of what it was in, in 1990. And so, as we've heard, meat has become a target for change, with some claiming that it's an inefficient use of feed, in the sense that we use feed that could be fed to humans to feed a lot of our livestock. It leads to uh, unhealthy human populations, and it, and it also uh, emits significant amounts of greenhouse gases. But it's also worth just pausing to consider the benefits that livestock production begin, uh, uh, convey. In particular, in developing countries, livestock production is a significant route out of poverty for many, for many families and many households. So if you acquire a cow and you're able to produce dairy products, it's a very easy way of getting your access into the market and generating a surplus on your farm and moving from a subsistence agriculture to a market-based so, market agriculture. Livestock plays a very important role in, the, in, that, in that context. Ruminants, of course, eat grass. We can't eat grass. And so by using ruminants, we're able to produce food on areas that are probably not suitable to producing many other agricultural, many other arable, arable crops. So that's the second impact. And also, livestock contribute to uh, maintaining the delicate ecosystem balance that exists in those parts of the world, in particular in, 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 the, in the upland areas. And I heard an interesting anecdote just last weekend, actually, about, about this, which suggested that midge populations in those parts of the world where livestock is moving away has fallen. And I thought, great, that's lovely. If I go walking in those hills, I'm not going to get bitten to death by midges. But, of course, midges are food for birds. And so as you move the livestock out of those areas, you're removing an essential food source for, those, for, those, for, the, for the bird life that lives in that area. Why does the livestock support midges? Well, because the poaching of the land creates a pools of stagnant water around the fields, which are obviously places where midge larvae can, be, can breed and, and reproduce. Clearly not a major influence, but it does illustrate the impacts of, of, of livestock production and the delicate uh, relationships that exist between our agriculture and the ecosystems that support agriculture and, and support our life. However, nevertheless, it's probably fair to say that some dietary change is desirable. And my work focuses very heavily on the driver of change being at the consumer end of things. I think that fundamentally, if we want to achieve change in terms of what we're producing, we have to start by influencing what people are, what people are consuming. So I've done quite a lot of work recently on, well, not recently, over the last five years, really, on, on looking at fiscal instruments as a way of influencing, influencing people's diets. But first, from a health perspective, but then uh, subsequently in terms of, of greenhouse gas emissions. So the first piece of work that, I, that I'll talk about, the first of two, uh, simulated the impacts of a, of a, of a so-called fat tax, where we taxed food products in a way which was designed to uh, uh, put a higher tax on products that had higher saturated fat content. So we, we simply looked at the saturated fat content of food products, and we raised the price of those food products by one percentage point for every percentage point of saturated fat that there was in the product. So milk and cream went up by 1.82%, beef went up by 6.28%. And we also combined that in order to keep it fiscally neutral, which means that the net revenue to the government was zero, with a subsidy on fruit and vegetables. And it produced a very large subsidy on fruit, fruit and vegetables of, 20, of 27%. Now, I'm not necessarily advocating that as a sensible policy, but there are some fairly big price changes there which one might expect to produce fairly uh, effective changes in people's diets. 
And remember, that, that study was primarily directed at understanding what was happening or influencing people's healthy eating choices. The good thing was that we moved the average level of fruit and vegetable consumption into the five-a-day range. But that was the only good piece of news. All of the other um, uh, nutrients in the diet were still outside the range that was recommended by Saken when uh, they put together their report. And if you looked at the impacts on, on health in the population, if you look at the average level of re relative risk across the population of coronary, coronary uh, heart disease, Compared to the situation where it would be if we ate according to dietary guidelines, that average level of re relative risk fell from 1.78 down to 1.72. So really tiny changes in the healthiness of the population. And if you think about it, the reason why that happens or why, that, why you don't get big changes is very obvious. Because what you do, all you do is you just shift the distribution very slightly in the direction that you want it to. So the mean consumption changes, but you're still left with people who have very poor diets eating slightly better, but their diets will still be poor. A fiscal instrument will only ever produce marginal changes in people's, in people's diets. So if you're interested in getting significant changes in poor quality diets, that is not the instrument on its own that will meet your, meet your needs. So again, a similar story when you look at greenhouse gas uh, taxes or taxes that are based on uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So if we tax food categories according to their carbon emissions, we produce a policy that has a price rise of 10% for meat, which we might expect, but of course all food emits some carbon, carbon emissions. So if you apply that policy, you'll also raise fruit and vegetable prices by 3.5%, three and, three and which you don't want to do if you're interested in increasing people's healthiness of their diets. Overall, what happens is that greenhouse gas emissions will fall by 5 to 6%. But very importantly, and another thing that you, you, we observe with taxes on food products, is that the poor bear the much the larger burden of these taxes relative, uh, relative to the rich. It's the, it's the, it's the rich that, um, that have a significantly less burden than the, than the poor. So, as I say, taxes produce marginal, marginal changes in, in, in diets. And what we're talking about, what we need to achieve, is a much more profound change in, in, in the diet. And there is a temptation, I think, in doing that for us to move or to, to, to try and think about a single policy which will produce those kinds of profound changes in people's in diets that we're, that, we're, that we're interested in. But actually, if you think about it, the instances where single policy instruments have produced profound changes in people's behaviour are very, very small. I can think of two, there may be more, but the first one is the smoking ban. I don't think that putting prices up on cigarettes was the thing that changed the way in which we, uh, our culture of, of smoking, uh, 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 as we have observed in the last five or so years. It wasn't the taxes. It was the ban on smoking, and it's made it much more socially unacceptable to smoke in, in, in public. And the second one is seat belts. People don't wear seat belts because they're worried that policemen are going to be looking over their shoulder and fining them. People wear seat belts because the law was there and the culture of, 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 of sitting in the, car, in the car changed. But there aren't many other examples of policy changes of that nature where one instrument produced a complete change in, in policy. What we actually need, and in the case of food, it's really clear to me, that the complexities and the way in which our diet is linked to all sorts of different features, health, greenhouse gases, sustainability of the environment, um, and, and, and other lifestyle choices as well, that we need a much more nuanced approach to policy making than those kind of single hits. And if you like, it's much more Bradley Wiggins than Lance Armstrong that we need to, to, be, to be looking at in this, in, this, in this case. Different people choose different diets for different reasons. And in fact, different people sometimes choose the same diet for different reasons. And if, let me just illustrate that point. I'm coming to an end. I'll shut up in a minute, I promise. If you think about the time-poor, income-rich single male and an income-poor, time-rich single mother, those people, if we look at their shopping trolleys, they may well have very similar shopping trolleys in terms of what's in them. There are lots of ready meals, lots of, uh, lots of convenience food in those, in those trolleys. But the reasons why those two people are choosing those trolleys are completely different. 
The single male is choosing them because he hasn't got time, he can't be bothered cooking and eating for himself, he just wants a quick hit. The single mother is choosing those meals because she can't cope, she isn't rich enough to afford to buy, uh, buy raw materials and cook from, from, first, from first principles. And really importantly, when you come to design policy in those two contexts, those two people will respond completely different to different types of policy measures. So if you go back to the, the, the tax example, the single male won't care if you put the price of his products up by 10% because he's rich enough to afford it. The single mother will be really significantly impacted and probably will change her diet uh, um, uh, significantly. So what we need to do, and I think this is a piece of evidence that perhaps uh, Friends of the Earth need to think about, is a much more careful understanding of why different groups of people are choosing the diets that they're, that they're choosing. I don't think we've got an evidence base that explains well enough the reasons why people are choosing the diets that they are. And I would go further than that and say I don't think we've got a clear evidence base for why people are actually choosing the lifestyles that they're choosing. Food choice and dietary choice is just one component of a much wider lifestyle choice that people are making. And I think we have to understand all of that complexity if we're going to make realistic strides in designing effective policy. Probably heard enough from this side of the room for a little while. So does anybody have any burning questions to, to kick things off? Yep. Question ahead. In fact, I've just been talking to some to people here about uh, resistance. You can obviously genetically modify poultry to be resistant to um, to flu, but flu might but flu might take. Uh, we know that flu changes all the time. You get the odd mutation, and that happens quite quickly. How long is it likely to last for? And if you do find a, a solution, will you have a totally different um, uh, variety of flu in a couple of years' time, which will also um, affect um, the uh, poultry stock? Yes, the, the approach we're taking is to try and uh, develop a, a, a novel gene that will target all uh, varieties of flu. Um, but I think we have to accept that it's very likely that uh, the, there's, there's the potential for the flu evolving around it. But it's much like vaccines and antibiotics, that uh, they only, they're only effective for a certain period of time. So we would have to have the same sort of strategy that we should have done with antibiotics. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we're almost forced into with vaccines is changing it. So it would have to change. You wouldn't use one new uh, GM modification and expect to use that forever. You would have to change it and maybe cycle them so that you used one for five years. And, but we haven't got as far as modeling that and we'd have to do that sort of thing. Um, definitely, you couldn't uh, expect it to last forever. You mentioned that one of the problems with vaccines is that not everyone can afford them. Mm. So how would that work with the GM chickens if you think about smallhold farmers in places like Vietnam where um, bird flu comes from? How would they get their hands on yeah, these GM so chickens? So it's, it's not so much that people can't afford it, it's that it, it, they add to the cost. I think it would, they would, it would largely be within the, more, the bigger production facilities, but uh, the production of poultry is, is really very rapidly going into big facilities in, in African countries as well as in, the, uh, in Asia. So the majority of birds will be uh, big, big producers. And if you cut down the risk, uh, you cut down the risk for the small uh, producers as well. Any more questions? Hello, um, my name is Hilary. I run a sort of think tank on responsible innovation and how we sort of involve society in thinking through some of these complicated issues around technology. And in fact, I'm hopefully doing one on artificial meat. And you haven't talked about artificial meat, so I'm <laughs> quite disappointed. Um, but one of the things about what this sort of new phrase of responsible innovation is that society is involved in thinking through these issues. But every time seems to come a little sort of microcosm of what we've had tonight, which is, you know, one speaker speaks, and you think, gosh, yeah, that's really interesting. Well, yeah, yeah, she's right. Another one goes, no, it's not about that. It's about something. And you think, oh, gosh, she's right. He's right. And then poor old society is supposed to try and help us all navigate all this. And I wondered what your, you know, your observations were, either, you know, about how 
you know, how governments, how we all are supposed to make sense of what we choose and how, what our choices are, given the fact that no one seems to agree, everybody's statistics seem to contradict each other's, and we don't quite trust any of you anyway. <laughs> and I wondered if you had any observations on that. Yes. I, I think, you know, that's um, a very fair point. That's one of the reasons we started the Eating Better Alliance, because um, we were getting the messages that people were confused about what we were all asking for in the context of meat in, in this, this area. So um, we have worked very hard to bring lots of different public health development, international development, environmental conservation groups to, to a common message common facts, common understanding, and, and uh, I, think, I think you're right, and we've got a, a website and we're trying to create that debate, but whether we're reaching the public is, is another thing, and I, I, you know, I would say, sometimes I, I say this slightly controversially, and I don't think a lot of the public want to care, and I think it's government's role and business's role to make sure that those that don't want to care, don't want to read a label, don't want to read an article about it, don't have to. They should be absolutely sure that what they're buying is doing the least harm. Um, both to them and, and to the environment and to, to labourers labourers globally and things like that. So I think, you know, there's a big role for government and business in this. But it sounds like in some cases the government is has stalled. So in America, the FDA has been criticised just last week for taking 19 years to debate over whether or not this salmon should be allowed on the market. So if it takes the FDA that long to, to not come to, to a decision, <laughs> What can we do? Because they're worried about what the public's going to, to say if they, if they go for it. And in the meantime, it's stifling innovation, people are saying, or nobody's going to want to invest in, in these kinds of technologies because they're never going to get to market. Well, my response partly would be, do we really need to? We actually have a lot of the solutions already. You know, we've got a huge amount of um, very highly productive farming. Um, there's, a, you know, there's a case for increasing and uh, reducing the yield gap in some parts of the world. But, you know, that case of salmon, we don't actually need super salmon. Um, we actually need to invest in, in um, herbivorous fish, to be honest, because that's a much less intensive, much less uh, harmful production system. But, they've you know, the FDA, FDA have just approved a, a new crop very, very quickly, um, which is going to be stacked gene technology using 2,4-D pesticide-resistant genes within a, a, within a crop. So it's going to be resistant to glyphosate and 2,4-D. And this is stacked gene, single gene technologies stacked in one crop, so you'll be able to use loads of different herbicides on, on one crop. And that was quite quick, so I don't think they're always that slow. Helen, did you want to respond about this idea that, that GM is a distraction and um, Yes, I, I, I think actually I, I agree that GM is a distraction in that there's been a, a huge amount of effort uh, in, uh, to resist introduction of GM technologies. And uh, I think that the it shouldn't be the technology because we know that really uh, there's no evidence really that the technologies in themselves are unsafe or risky. Um, there's a huge amount of GM crops grown now. Um, and I think that, uh, so it's a distraction. We should be looking at what the purpose is. So for example, you can get herbicide resistant uh, uh, rapeseed through genetics and it's not regulated and through GM, and it is regulated. So we should look more at, you know, is the purpose a useful purpose? Is it a valuable thing? Are the things we need to consider in, in, in allowing these things? And it's, uh, to me, GM is one of our tools in making animals and plants uh, more productive, uh, more environmentally safe in many ways. Uh, and if we don't use all the tools that we have, then uh, we will be less able to deal with all these uh, challenges we have in, in feeding the world and getting people to have a good diet and so on. So I do think uh, the effort that's been focused on being anti-GM has been a distraction. Let's, I'll take some more questions. I think we've got one here. Um, I notice in these kinds of discussions on, on things like food security that one of the things that's often not covered as much is population growth and policies on actually limiting population growth. Um, we're looking at different solutions to kind of help uh, redistribute resources or, or introduce new ones to help feed a growing population, but the growing population part, I don't mean to be cruel or anything, but uh, I don't know much about uh, how policies have been implemented for curbing population growth, encouraging people to have smaller families, or whether that even works? Do any of you have any comments on that? 
So if you're, talk if you're talking about direct birth control, um, direct intervention to limit people's family sizes, I think that's a really bad idea. And the reason why I think it's a really bad idea is because the processes of uh, economic growth, uh, uh, increased food production, um, population growth, are all intimately connected. So as, as incomes go up, uh, well, as populations go up, it increases the income and the productivity within, within the population. It, makes, it gets people out of, out of poverty. As people move out of poverty, they start to voluntarily restrict their family sizes. And so the danger is, if you, I mean, it, it's, it's quite complex, the, the, the interrelationships between these things. But the danger is if you intervene and you put a block on one of those things, then you're unwittingly going to stop some of the other things that you want to happen that are, are happening. And the one that you, you, you know, you will, you will trap people in poverty. That's what will happen. Income growth will not happen. You will not get migration from the agricultural sector into the industrial sector. You will not get economic growth taking place. Um, but population growth works if it is done voluntarily as a part of that overall, that overall process. And, and that will happen automatically. People will restrict their family sizes as they become richer. Any other questions? Uh, no mention's been uh, said about advertisers, which obviously make a big difference with what people actually eat. Okay, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's a brilliant point, to be honest. I've written a 10-point plan for food security, and that's one of the points. You know, we need to curb advertising of... Um, foods in ways that is really sensible, as, as um, he was saying, you know, we need to do it in ways which actually help people, not uh, punish them or make them feel bad about themselves. And um, I, think, I think there is a case for really um, having quite strong curbs on advertising of unhealthy food, um, and uh, particularly targeted at children. There's a huge amount of very insidious covert advertising of really junk foods to children, um, and that's having a massive effect globally. Um, and yeah, so I, I couldn't agree more. It's, it's something that is really slightly neglected, and I, I would confess that I've slightly neglected it, and we ought to be doing something about it. Sorry. What would... So, mm. Sorry. Yeah, I think it's an issue, isn't it, that people yeah. go from poor <coughs> nutrition <coughs> straight to the bad <laughs> nutrition without going through the, yeah. the improved nutrition. But, you, mm. but you, again, you have to be very careful mm. because, because the vast majority of people who see adverts actually benefit from those adverts. They actually make an informed choice, they, they understand something, and it contributes mm -hmm. to economic growth. There are, there are small parts of the population that respond very badly to adverts, and the reasons why they respond very badly to adverts are particular to those groups of people. And so it's the same message that I was giving when I was talking earlier, that we have to understand why those people are so susceptible, and children are a really good example of that. I, I, I completely agree that that is a really good example of where you can intervene in a targeted way in banning children's advertising of certain types of food. But there are all sorts of other types of advertising that affect all sorts of other groups of people in society. So we have to be careful not to say, let's just hit the advertisers and let's hit commercial interests. Let's find out where the problems actually are and then target those, those specific problems. I would say it's marketing as well as advertising. Mm -hmm. much wider than advertising. If we, if we um, flip the idea from advertising food products to advertising campaigns, marketing campaigns. You've worked on a number of different campaigns mm. to reduce meat consumption. Or what, what, does this, what would you like to see marketed and advertised to people? Well, I mentioned the um, Pasture-Fed Livestock Association. That's tiny, but it would be really nice to see that survive, uh, survive and grow, that people are actually um, becoming more aware, and more people, not just high-income earners, are actually aware of the... Um, process of production and could choose less but better meat products. I, I don't have the money to do big marketing. <laughs> I don't have any money to do it. So I rely on social media and, and media coverage and I, I'd love to have um, the kind of budget that Nestle have for produce, you know, or Danone for marketing their um, uh, sugary, yogurty, dairy products, you know. And we have to counter that. So it's quite, it, it's a difficult one actually. I don't quite know how to answer. You know, I, I, do try and campaign and reach as many people as they can, but it's uh, it's quite hard. Uh, yeah, I've got a question over here. Oh, and yeah, this is on. Yeah. yeah. Hello. 
Uh, basically, I have a problem with the idea that advertisement is the solution. I mean, there has been a lot of studies, especially with children, where it has been explained about nutrition to them, and then they will have a healthy treat and a cookie, and they will always choose the cookie, even after ex everything has been explained to them. So, at least in the children part, they will choose the sweet. So, from that side, I don't think children are susceptible to advertisement, they just like the sweet. And this, this, uh, there has been some studies, especially in the U.S., done about that. And uh, uh, based on that, and, uh, and on the other hand, the children don't like buy the, the, pro the food. It is the mothers and the family. So my, and I come from Venezuela, and basically we eat a lot of home-cooked food. But it's not because my mother is cooking it. It's because we have a great working class of people who are very poor who will be happy to work as a, a house uh, a helper. And this person cooked delicious food, and they eat them themselves. So actually, the nutrition of the Venezuelans is really good, but it's because society is really bad. Here in the UK, we have the opposite problem. We have a great big uh, middle class who is doing very well for themselves, but they're all working in the offices in the city, and they don't have time to cook. So uh, do you think, really, a person working in the city will say, yes, I will take less hours to work for my big company to cook a healthy meal? Or would I rather earn you know, the wage that I wish to earn in order to live how I wish to live? <laughs> Richard. Well, OK. Um, <laughs> uh, no, it's <laughs> answer that question. But, 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 but with, with information, I, 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 have to be careful. I don't want to say information, but understanding where their food is coming from and understanding um, what's in the products that they're buying can influence some people, rich people, to make better, better choices about, uh, about what, they, what they food, they're, they're consuming. So we're not talking about, I don't think we're talking about going back to the old ways, the old ways in which we used to prepare food. But what we are talking about is consuming the food that we want to consume now, but doing it in a more responsible and sensible way. I think we have about three questions in this corner, so perhaps let's take all three of them and then we can um, answer them together. Um, I'd like to ask, um, Vicky heard more about the interesting point you made about environmental services of biodiversity in the farmed environment, and recently there's been a lot in the scientific press from Lynn Dix from Cambridge and Charles Godfrey in Oxford and, and others um, about how we need to value and look after these things, but I wondered what policy instruments there are in place, because it's my perception that regulation of destruction of biodiversity in the farmed environment has become weaker with the, the present government. Thank you. I think the lady in the red top here. Yeah. I was um, interested to listen to Michael Pollan on the radio uh, yesterday, the food activist, and his uh, mantra is um, eat food, not much, sorry, eat food, not much, mostly plants. Um, and he's currently uh, promoting his book, which is a sort of love affair of cooking as a way of reconnecting people with food in the first world as a sort of political act. And I suppose in reference to what you just said about um, encouraging people to know more about their food in the first world, where it comes from and what they're eating, I think one of the points that he is making is that that's very difficult because the way in which large manufacturers produce food and promote food in ways that is very obfuscating about what is contained in that food. And so I wondered if the panel could comment on that and also comment on the reality of cooking as a sort of political act and whether it can change the way that we uh, eat and uh, our public health relating to diet. I think that was... Yeah. Hi. Um, I think it was Vicky who mentioned that the argument that there's enough food to go around full stop. And I think... And it's a governance issue as to how that's redistributed. And I think I would have agreed with you kind of 10 years ago when, you know, this argument's been made a, a lot, but I, it strikes me that it's, it's more complicated than it's just a governance issue. It strikes me that it's a cultural issue, it's a transport and storage issue. And so I'm just interested to see, is that still a valid argument that globally we provide enough food for everyone? I think if that was the case, then we wouldn't be spending that much money on UK aid for malnutrition in developing countries. And so is there space, therefore, for new technologies like GM to, 
to bring that on. So I'm just interested in, in your argument in that space. I think if we, if we take that last question first, and just to add to that, um, we mentioned earlier some of the other uh, capabilities that come with GM. And if you think about GM crops that have added vitamin D, for example, for children who have um, deficiencies in certain countries, there are, it's not just about producing more food faster, there are also added benefits to GM crops that address some of these issues. So perhaps let's start with that question and then move on to the other two in reverse order. Vicky, do you want to start? Oh, sure, I'll start. Yeah, okay. Uh, on the governance issue, going backwards. Yeah, it's absolutely more complex than I had to say in about two minutes. Um, so I would agree there's an awful lot of different things that would need to happen in terms of governance, trade rules, um, how uh, the food, the, the very concentrated food um, system treats both the consumers below and the farmers above, because it's like an hourglass. You've got a very small number of buyers in the middle. And that, that small number of buyers have huge control, as, as I said. So that's one part of it. But waste, absolutely. There's a fantastic report by the Institute of Mechanical Engineers identifying some of the incredible loss of food at the farm and supply chain end. And then there's the huge waste that we, as domestic consumers and retailers, uh, lose at the, at the domestic end. You know, so the, you know, this whole, you know, I could write a book. On, on the governance issues, it's not simple at all. And, but I absolutely disagree with you that it, it's not part of, it, it's no longer valid. Because, I mean, for instance, the University of Minnesota released a report last year, very detailed analysis of what crops are being used for. And, you know, we could feed, if we, if just, just on the issue of feeding crops to livestock, and that's not what, this isn't what we're advocating, but if you stop feeding crops, as opposed to grass and things, stop feeding crops to livestock, you could feed four billion more people. And that's the University of Minnesota, really detailed modelling. Um, and there's many studies I'm seeing practically every week with similar kind of figures. And I'm not suggesting we're going to go all that way because, uh, you know, as you are saying, chicken is an incredibly cheap protein and is very much advocated globally. But what the chicken is fed on is, is very important, as, as you noted, and it's a huge amount of grain. And the more chicken we eat because it's very cheap, the more grain you need and the more protein you need. So there's a vicious circle because it becomes cheaper and more accessible then you, get, you grow more of it and if you need more land. And so it might be very efficient, but you're demanding more. Whereas beef and lamb, ruminants, goats, whatever, can actually grow in areas where you can't grow crops. So, you know, so it's a very, I, I totally agree, and I have written loads of different things on this. It's very complex. Going, going on to the issue of um, cooking as a political act. I, I'm in two minds about that because I think, yes, and I think Mark Pollan is, is great, but I can't help feeling that there's a sort of generation of people um, that are, are river cottage lovers and have got time and the inclination to think about these things a lot, and yet and there's the rest of us, whatever. <laughs> and I, you know, I love Hugh Fragment is still, I love Michael Pollan, but I think, as I said earlier, I think there's an awful lot of role for government to actually intervene. So, yes and no. <laughs> yeah. But I think cooking is political. Act. This question of how difficult it is to know where our food comes from, yeah. what can be done about that? Richard, do you have any thoughts on mm. um, uh, well, I think there's lots that can be done, and I, and I echo what Vicky's just said, that I think that that strategy of reconnecting people to their food works with certain groups. Of, um, there's a danger of me sounding like a crack record here, but it works with some people, but it doesn't work with everybody. Mm. I think that the food industry, the food processing and retailing industry, is actually becoming really interested in this, and you see it already in Waitrose with the picture of the farmer on the, on the product so that kind of tells you where that's come from. And what I hear when I talk to, I don't know whether there's anybody in the audience from supermarket, but if, 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 when I talk to the supermarkets now, they are really, really interested in this. And what they're really interested in doing is using some of the new data models and techniques that are available. So, for example, you could put a QR code on, the pit on, your, on, your, on, your, on your meat product, and you would be able to see every step on your phone. You'd scan it with your mobile phone, and you'd see every step that that, thing, that product's been through on the way from the farmer's field in wherever, Peru, through to the supermarket. So you'd understand, but that's not going to work with everybody. It will only work with those people that are interested in being reconnected to the farmers. But I think the food industry is interested in doing that sort of thing. That's what I hear from them. Would you say that the supermarkets don't really mind if they have to change their model that they work with as long as they still make the same amount of money? So they, they, you know, if they well, can make the same amount yeah. of money about, uh, from selling people smaller amounts yeah. of food where... The, they've invested more in allowing people to know where it came from. I think so, yeah. Probably yeah. 
won't mind changing, but surely the, the issue is that the, the huge increase in consumption isn't coming from the Western world, it's coming from Africa and India and China. And, and that's, that's, you know, the, these sort of questions about knowing where your food comes from are, are not on their agenda yet. Um, I, but that I think they will be very quickly. They will, yeah. And, uh, you know, as I was saying, if, if the, the fact that the populations are going to be urban, yeah. we're going to see very similar sorts of patterns yeah. and demands oh. coming from those populations yeah. as we see here. And I, and I imagine that, well, Tesco's haven't done it very successfully though, recently, <laughs> but, but other supermarkets are thinking about how they, how they move into those markets. Mm. Well, I know they are, because mm. I've talked to them. While we're on this issue of, of understanding where our food comes from, Helen, how do you see that being tackled with GM food? How can we know how much GM is influencing the food that we buy, if there's any cross-contamination? How can you really take that back to the source? I, th I think uh, there it is at the moment regulated, but you know the, the animals we eat are probably fed GM. But should that be on food packaging? Well, I, I, I mean, if, you, if I talk to colleagues in the US, they think that uh, GM food should not be labelled because they are not effectively different from non-GM. There is not anything that you are writing by labelling genetic modified that you're identifying that makes them different. Uh, I think because people are interested in knowing whether it's GM or not, you should label it. But it is rather meaningless because, you know, it's GM for what? And what does that affect, that uh, particular, you know, maize or soya or whatever? What is the effect and how would it influence it as a food for a person? So it's, it's quite a complicated, uh, I think, very complicated issue, mm. the whole labelling thing. Um, but I think, you know, in the, in the States, they're rather rather arrogant about this, actually, and don't understand that uh, you, you can't just ignore the concerns of people, as you say, of yeah. some groups of people anyway. Mm. So I think, I mean, I think that's a really Im important point, actually, to, you know, to just, I, I, you know, if I could l encourage the natural scientists in the audience to go home with one message tonight, it's that you have to engage with the food consumer and carefully explain and get them to understand what genetic modification actually is a, a, about. The, I mean, the process is complicated, and I was interested in the question that came from the middle from that, from that respect, that engaging with the consumer. And I was worried when you said, we're worrying about whether we're going to call snipping GM or not, because in a consumer's mind, as soon as they hear that, that you're snipping around in the genes, they're going to say, that's GM. It won't matter what yeah, you no, say. I, I, I would agree with they, you there. They, but uh, the fact is that you can make a change in the lab that could be, uh, you could find, yeah. in, you know, had occurred spontaneously, uh, because there's a huge amount of genetic variation between, yeah. you know, between us, uh, and uh, it's identifying that. I uh, get it, but I don't but, think but the I Daily Mail think, reader gets it. I don't think we <laughs> should say, try and make the case that it's not GM, because yeah. then people would just begin to think that we're trying to pull a fast one. Mm. <laughs> and that's very not constructive. So. Can I come in there? Because, I mean, there's a lot of evidence that consumers are obviously concerned for reasons that they want to know what's in their food, and I think it, the GM products that are available now aren't similar to, to products that you could get. GM soy is not the same as non-GM soy. Um, non Roundup ready soy or BT but you can put BT mm. uh, as a, is a, an acceptable mm. organic pesticide so uh, you absolutely. can add it you can add it so you can have so a choice whether to buy that or not but if you haven't got a choice whether to buy GM or not GM so no, but but it, it, should, be, you know, it should be what the modification is not that, that it's mm. genetically modified but I think there's a wider point which actually part comes into what you were asking about which what, what is the system which GM, or not, but I, I think GM exacerbated, is sustainable in the long term. And uh, there is actually a huge drop in interest in biodiversity and the ecosystem services. Despite the we have, fact we but have that a natural... That relate to being GM, because it, we no. don't have it in this country, so I know, I know, but we, it relates to our GM systems of agriculture. I would argue GM would... Current mm. available GM crops would exacerbate that problem. As they have in America, you've got a huge increase in herbicide use and potential threats to things like the monarch the butterfly population. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that we, we, should, we, we haven't actually covered what you were asking about, because actually those systems of um, natural capital 
that we rely on to provide our pollinators, to provide our, our wonderful areas that we, we go and visit, to provide our water catchment areas, are neglected at the moment. They really are. They're not part of the equation. And I hear that all the time from people who are in stakeholder groups at DEFRA or talking to, to um, uh, bodies around the country and the, and the loss of um, budgets for Natural England or from the Environment Agency. It's, it's a very dire situation. And, you know, I think... GM is part of that, but it's, a, it's, a, it's one part of it. If we happen to have GM coming in next year, which this government seems to want, we would have glyphosate-resistant oilseed <coughs> rape being grown in the UK, which you might argue doesn't increase glyphosate um, as, a, as a herbicide use on those crops. That would slightly go against the point of that crop. <coughs> and yes, that has big impact on biodiversity. But, uh, I, I mean, I think the pressures are such that we should be prepared to... Uh, use all the tools that we have to be uh, to increase our productivity without increasing our land use. I think there's issue for protecting land use, but as we've already discussed, there is actually enough productivity, and we're just using it poorly. Well, there there is now, but we you know we have we know there's the demand will be increasing. <laughs> there's enough for, for billions more. And we're wasting an awful lot. Of, you know, pe people waste a lot in their houses, but also the, the supply chain is a lot of waste. Take a few more questions. I know there's one in the middle there, and two there, and um, um, one in the middle. <laughs> let's take these two. Let's take these two first, and then we'll come back to the others. Um, my question is that there's an unseen carnivore at the feast, which we haven't mentioned, and that's um, the pet industry. Oh, that's um, <laughs> and there must there are millions of dogs and cats, not just in this country, but around the world, increasing number. And I, I, I don't know how much they eat in the way of meat, but it's, I'm guessing it's an awful lot of food production goes into pets, which are essentially useless <laughs> apart from as... Well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm putting my... <laughs> I'm saying, this is my opinion, they are useless, they don't do anything for us, so. That's a good question. Um, we'll take this other question as well now and then. Yeah. If I could just add to that, um, Magnus Pike years ago actually said that the best part of the animal was actually fed to cats and dogs now, because <laughs> it's all the internal bits which are mainly protein. <laughs> and the thing I was going to add was uh, one of the problems is that people want food which uh, is refined and things like this and therefore a lot of byproducts are actually fed to cattle uh, to use up the skins and all the other bits and the, the potatoes which are too small or wrong shape or what have you that, hum you know, that are not displayed on the supermarket shelf. So how much impact is the pet industry having and are we being too fussy about what we eat? I don't know. Do you know any figures about it? Don't, I don't know any figures. I, do. but I, I, but I have to say I work adjacent to a vet school, so I have a lot of colleagues who are companion animal vets. So, But I do concern myself about the amount of uh, meat that is fed to pets. And uh, also, uh, interesting, you know, if you think about GM and genetics, if you look at dogs, the genetic variation uh, with many deleterious effects for the animals that you get by just simple selection in dogs is quite an issue, I think, as well. Uh, but, you know, people want their pets. I mean, I, 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 well, I, I mean, I think that, I don't know this, but I suspect that quite a lot of what's fed to the pets is waste. Yeah. And, and what I think the, the, the point that comes out of what's just been said in the absence of the knowledge about exactly how much is fed to, to pets is the complexity of the waste issue. Yeah. Actually, it, it is tempting to say, let's look at this figure or whatever it is, 30% of food that's produced on the farm is wasted. But the way in which it's used in alternative ways is, is, is complicated, and it's not necessarily the case that all of that 30% would be available for human consumption. And one thing that really irritates me slightly about that figure is that in that figure is all of the, the grain that is fed to livestock that could potentially be fed to humans but the steps that have to be gone through in order for that grain to be fed to humans are not made clear at all. And I think mm. that, you know, that there is a bit of sort of creative accounting, if you like, that's done in that, in that, in that area because of that. Um, just a minor, well, not a minor point, we're actually supporting something called the pig idea, which is looking at how we can get more um, waste or not, you know, let's call it something else, surplus food um, that, that can't be fed to humans that uh, could be fed to pigs, as they used to be one of our digesters. Um, and there is a lot that has already been done, a lot of um, bakery 
surplus is actually currently fed to pigs and there's quite a thriving industry, it could be a lot bigger. There are a lot of perceived barriers that actually aren't real barriers to doing that. And mm. we're supporting a campaign to get local authority officers to encourage it at a county level. And uh, actually, we'd like to see a, a removal of the ban on feeding of um, more catering waste and other things, as long as it's done very responsibly and carefully, which was brought in after the um, foot and mouth. Foot and, and mm. foot and mouth yeah. mm. So that, that's a very good point. On the, pe on the pets, I, I, uh, I can't say. But I do know how difficult it was for me to introduce a meat campaign at Friends of the Earth. If I introduced a pet campaign, <laughs> I, you know, I'm a political realist, so I think it would be very difficult. But that's no excuse. It's, uh, it needs to be looked at. Yeah. Maybe we need different pets. Spider I did keep stick insects. Was a very good pet, stick insects. You go grab a bit of ivy, and that's a fantastic pet. <laughs> we've got about five more minutes, so let's take some more questions. Uh, we've got one at the back there, and um, this gentleman here. There was one over and there. As well, well, okay, we'll take take those three now. So, yep. Hi, I, I wanted to ask a question that Catherine you alluded to, which was about. Um, GM crops for specific deficiencies in diet. So there is this uh, large amount of um, wasted food which we could better use, and there are some easy wins there. Well, not easy, but there are some gains we can make there. But what about, and I'm thinking vitamin A here. I read an interesting article about um, GM bananas which are being developed for Uganda, which can um, uh, prove, uh, solve a problem there potentially with vitamin A deficiency in the diet. Um, do we think there's a place for that? Um, if not now, maybe in the future? That's a good question. Helen, I presume you're going to say yes. Yes, <laughs> I would say yes. I, I, I don't see why you would not use that route to, uh, uh, you know, to benefit the popula particular populations. Helen, no, sorry. Uh, it's okay. I think it's interesting that this question, um, and the, well, the, the particular rice, golden rice, which you're referring to, has been in development for a very long time and hasn't quite delivered. They're initially using the wrong kind of rice, and there's all sorts of problems. And actually the farmers, and I'm, I, it is the farmers who are actually saying we don't want it, a lot of them. But I think it's interesting that we tend to neglect the other options. And there's an awful lot of other options for actually ensuring that a really good balanced diet using a lot of more leafy vegetables and actually helping communities and farmers to actually diversify in order to do that. Um, and I think, you know, that's true in many instances where we're looking at GM and narrow technologies to solve these problems where actually in the long term we need to diversify production to actually deliver a healthy, sustainable diet. I think in some crops, I mean, there's papaya in uh, Hawaii was nearly wiped out by a viral disease and they yeah. used a GM approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, you know, it saved the farmers and saved the, the local diet. And yeah. uh, I can't see that there is any reason to object to that use of yeah. GM. Mm -hmm. it's I, yeah. The monocrop problem is often the problem yeah. rather yeah. than yeah. whether it's GM or not. I, I, I think we have to be really careful here as we sit in this lovely room yes. in a, in a, in a, you know, with our stomachs full, with our children healthy at home, and we start saying these sorts of things because it, I, it, I, I think the golden rice story is scandalous, frankly. The fact that there, you know, this is potentially a lifesaver for thousands and, well, millions of children in the, develop, in the developing world. And the fact that it hasn't got out and into the, into the food system is really because the regulatory framework is so demanding on, 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 what, uh, on, that, on that production. It took more than 10 years to get, to get golden rice through the regulatory framework. And you, I mean, I, I accept that farmers, that farmers don't want to grow, but you have to ask the question, why don't farmers want to grow it? It's because the whole GM thing has demonized things. And I think, you know, we have to be really careful as we sit here comfortably and we make these kinds of pronouncements and think about what could actually happen for some really, really poor people in parts of the world that don't get the choice. But I also think we've got to think about who's in charge, who's in control, who owns a patent, which is actually Syngenta, ultimately. Even though they've left it for open source, it's, you know, there's a lot of well, more questions. Open source, they aren't going to make money. But they're holding they? the patent. So and that makes farmers nervous because they've seen what... Right. I think that's another, that's a, an, important, story, not an, an important yeah. issue, but one that <laughs> possibly, let's get in one or two more questions in the final minutes. Um, I think this gentleman, did you have a question? Uh, you just wait for the, for the microphone. And uh, do the panel think that laboratory grown meat is inevitable? <laughs> yeah, we've, we've avoided <laughs> that topic, so yeah. lab, lab grown burgers, 
Is it inevitable? Is it even sustainable? I think, I think we talked earlier, we, we can't see why you would bother. You know, <laughs> it's uh, very likely to be very expensive to produce because if you're going to grow cells in culture medium and so on, it's got to be all sterile and that is very expensive, uh, ensuring those conditions. And, you know, personally, I would much rather eat much less, half as much meat a week than, than bother with something that isn't really meat at all. I, I agree with that. I think. I, think, I mean, you know, it's, it's a long way off ever becoming yeah. something that's really commercially available. And there's a lot of hype around it, as there is about a lot of technologies. And uh, you've got to really look behind the hype. And I, you know, I think the, the issues around how to grow it, it would actually involve an awful lot of electricity, an awful lot of inputs, bovine fetal serums, and all sorts. They haven't found solutions to that yet. But you know, I just don't think it's a solution for here and now or for the next 10 years. Um, let's just take one final question. Uh, yes. Hi. So we've heard a lot about um, the problems in farming, things like wastage, etc. But I'd be really interested to hear what your thoughts are on how UK farmers should be responding to some of these questions, and how the government and policymakers could be helping and facilitating those changes. Big question. <laughs> Richard, do you want to start? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, what do I want to say? Um, we have to do our bit. We're, we're, in, we're, we're a small country, but we do produce food, and it's a very significant part of our, uh, our, our economy in this, in this country. So I think we do have to we have to we have to think about ways in which we raise raise productivity in our in our in our agricultural system for both you know the, the domestic interest and also for our um, in terms of contributing globally and I suppose that's 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 more important when you recognise that the parts of the world where population growth is going to be most significant are also the parts of the world where it's predicted that there's going to be the most severe impacts of climate change on their agricultural productivity. We might even see an increase in agricultural productivity in this country as a result of climate change. So it's beholden on those parts of the world, I think, to, to do something. We have to, we have to do it in a way which <coughs> is different from the past, though. And I, and, I, and I like the term sustainable intensification. I think it's a useful um, 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 uh, peg to hang thoughts on. I don't think we've done enough thinking about exactly what we what it means and so for example do we do we do we uh, sustainably intensify across all of our agricultural land in this country or do we do it <coughs> do we do it um, in um, pockets of land that are, um, uh, uh, do we intensify in pockets of land which are more um, suitable to intensifying and keep the uh, the sustainable bit if you like in other areas of land that are less less suitable to food production we haven't we haven't thought that through carefully enough I think but, but the message is clear that we have, to do, we, we have to do something and we have to do it in a way which is different from the way in which we've done, thing in the, done things in the past. Um, I've taken me a very long time to say all the things I didn't think government should do. One of them would be to make sure the retailers are playing fair. We have a new grocery code of practice and the ombudsman to oversee it, but it doesn't do enough to tackle low prices, uh, consistent low prices, for instance, in the dairy sector, which you know, really pushes farm farmers in the wrong direction. A race to the bottom. Um, I also already mentioned proper guidelines and um, things around sustainable diets and procurement, having leadership, showing leadership through what you buy for the government of state and in schools and hospitals, actually having a, a more sustainable diet that fits, fits uh, the future. And uh, climate change is amazing. We haven't mentioned it more, actually. Yeah, mm -hmm. having really good, helpful adaptation support for farmers and, and landowners. And that would include shifting the subsidy system, which is obviously the big money in farming, apart from what they get for, for the food system. Um, so shifting subsidies and investment in farming towards more uh, sustainable systems and mixed farming systems. Um, and globally, I think, oh, yeah, I probably should stop there. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's, is, you know, this is an area in which I can have an opinion like anybody else here, but I don't have uh, more information really. Okay, well, I think it's about time to, to wrap things up. Thank you very much for your questions, I'm sorry. We didn't have time for all of them. Um, I think it's customary for the panel to have one final question um, to take home. I was going to ask if there's one thing sort of that changed your mind um, 
or surprised you from the conversation this evening? Um, or perhaps let's just go with, if you could, if you could see one change made, whether it's to, to policy, to people's diets, you know, consumer habits, or to communication, what would it be if you could only pick, pick that one thing? Starting with you, Richard. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, off the top of my head, very quickly, I suppose one thing that I think I, it was it occurred to me when we were talking earlier this evening, actually, the, the, one thing that I, a missed opportunity, I think, in terms of forming people's dietary preferences is um, late teens and early 20s. We talk a lot about changing people's diets when they're kids and intervening with kids. We talk a lot about aged people, mm -hmm. but if I think about when I learned to cook and when I actually, you know, learned to cook spaghetti bolognese and why I eat loads of spaghetti bolognese now, it's when I was a student. <laughs> and so I think intervening at that stage represents a missed opportunity that we could actually pick up and try and, and, try and, and use. Well, that's amazing, because we have a Get Gobby competition for students, which is to do exactly that. Brilliant. Um, so <laughs> students can win £500 if they enter and win our competition called Get Gobby. Um, but that side, I think I've mentioned a lot of things I want to happen. I think the government actually having a um, showing leadership and having an integrated strategy on food and farming would be my dream. I don't see it happening um, anytime soon, particularly with the coalition government. But that, that would be uh, you know, a strategy which shows, that, as Richard was saying, there's no single bullet. We've got to have a proper strategy and strong vision for food and farming in the UK, which is sustainable and uh, equitable. And well, I think, I mean, I think, I guess, because uh, animal breeding and production is, is global, I think uh, I would like to see GM uh, regulated uh, globally in terms uh, of product and rather than the technology. 